So, so, hello, Sabita, Hailwisto, welcome, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining me today. I am Renatoros Britomatus Kimbrianus, uh, also known as Renatorcos Epomapus. Um, I am a Swiss citizen. I'm currently living in Colorado, which is coincidentally called the Switzerland of America. So I've got kind of a theme going on, if you can't tell already. Um, I'm a polytheist who focuses on the Gallo-Roman area of Germania Superior and uh, Raetia, and I specialize in the reconstruction and revitalization of the practice of the Helveti, the Reishi, and the beginning of the Confederacy of the Germanic Alemanni. Uh, his historically, all of these people interacted with one another and traded information, goods, language, and customs. And my goal, ultimately, is to take elements from all these people and merge them with the vibrant and surviving elements of folk religion of my home country and re-highlight its pagan origins. So, with that being said, we are going to go a bit into the play-by-play -play today. We're going to have a little bit of a, oh no, there you go. We're going to have a little bit of a plan. Uh, we're going to talk about what do we know about the Reishi? Who were they? Um, I think the correct pronunciation would be Reti, but uh, have been Americanized enough at this point. Uh, we have origins, their society, and we're just going to kind of go off that way. All right. So during Caesar's conquest of Gaul, he writes of many Gaulish tribes, both friend and foe he encounters along the way. He makes mention of the Germanic tribes living beyond the Rhine and also those who they've had contact with. He mentions the Druids, and he also kind of throws out something about the Reti. But he doesn't really expound. And for a long period of time, that's all we had. And Pliny and Strabo both wrote down their theories as to where the Reti come from or who they really are. But due to a scant archaeological record, we didn't really have much. And it's been kind of my mission over the last six, seven months to piece together disparate sources from surviving folklore and uh, archaeological records and inscriptions and uh, see what we can come up with and what we can take from this. So, when we ask, what do we know about the Reiti? It's probably easier to begin from the back end. It's probably easier to discuss who are they not. As such, I'll introduce some various theories and hypotheses put forward over the years on their and the, the stances of those theories within current academia. So over the years, there have actually been surprisingly very few people that have ever asked the question, who are the Reti? They're often described as mountain dwelling savages, uh, backwards Etruscans, uh, wild men. Um, very little was ever written down. Um, the Pliny the Elder wrote that they were uh, Etruscans chased out by migrating Gauls, and so they had to flee to the mountains where, sadly, they regressed and reverted back to a primal state, you know, that whole noble savage club-wielding thing. Um, and this will, uh, we'll call this Origin A. Uh, that is uh, the Etruscan origin as uh, first supported by Pliny. Um, and then in the 1960s, when, you know, that whole Italic fever um, regripped uh, Europe and people got interested again, um, people started looking at the language of the Reiti. What had they actually written down? Because they had not just one, but two, possibly three alphabets. And so there was a lot of uh, information to go off of and people started looking through those. And some scholars came to the conclusion that the Reiti must be a Semitic culture. Another labels them simply as Semitic peoples on account of their inscriptions and the many copious loanwords they shared with Anatolia, Phoenicia, Mesopotamia, and Illyrian cultures. While these scholars don't deny an Etruscan influence, they do point out that Ration bears a lot of influence from Illyria and Venetia. So, practically the same amount. Um, and we'll call this Origin B. Now, before we get into any more of this, there's a small hiccup that arises when discussing ration as a language, in that the definition is not clear cut. Ration is less a description of a language and more of a label of text we found that uses this alphabet and that is also verifiably a homogenous language. Uh, this means that all the inscriptions that we have of this label are ration, 
and we attribute this language to the Rations, but we shouldn't only attribute these inscriptions to the Rations or the Reiti. And we cannot be certain that these were the only alphabets or systems they used. Also, talking about Ration uh, doesn't take into consideration uh, the communion alphabet, um, which is strange because the current modern day stance uh, by scholars is that the community are largely considered to be ration. Um, it also doesn't take into consideration inscriptions using the Cisalpine or Leopontic alphabet, of which there are not many, but a few. Um, so, yeah. Regarding origin A, so we have several inscriptions of the Reti that utilize a version of the Etruscan alphabet that's very, very similar to Venetian, and that kind of already clues us in on some of the cultural exchange going on. While their language bears some similarity to Etruscan, it's most likely not derived from it. Um, there is also the matter of material culture. Notably, the material culture predates that of the Etruscans, and we actually don't find much Etruscan goods or art or statues or building techniques. There is very little physical evidence of Etruscan presence. Uh, nevertheless, an, a, a large amount of toponyms, so names of places, are in Etruscan. So the mystery deepens a little bit. You can understand why there's some back and forth there for a long period of time. Um, so what we can conclude from that is the language of the Reti was influenced by the Etruscans, but this was largely due to a very minor migratory group of peoples who happened to hold a large amount of military or financial power comparatively to the mountain-dwelling peoples who already lived there. So you have to think there's a new ruling class comes in and they got extra money, they got extra cash, they got extra guys, and they got extra weapons, and so over time, the language changes a little bit. Um, what's interesting, though, is that ration seems to lack several uh, forms and even tenses um, that are actually present within Etruscan, which might point towards why some Romans thought they were barbarized Etruscans, because their speech sounded rough and they were missing several key elements that they were used to hearing from Etruscans. Um, so the last thing that kind of puts the nail in the coffin for this theory is that uh, the timeline doesn't add up. Um, the time that it would have uh, taken for Etruscan and Ration to deviate is a long period of time. So if they ever had a common origin, this would have been well, well, well into the beginning or, or the middle of uh, the, the early Bronze Age. So we would have had to put uh, a large amount of time behind us and not the couple hundred years of wiggle room that Pliny gives us. So quite frankly, the variance of the language doesn't match up with the expected timeline and the arrival of the Etruscan people in Italy. And the linguistic support is not present enough. Throughout the presence of the Etruscans, uh, they did develop toponyms, but that only points towards an influence and not an origin. Now, origin B, um, it arose to prominence, like I said, with the reignition of Celtic fever among the scholars in Italy. Um, and some people went out to say that the Rations were no people at all. They're actually just a conglomeration, you know, various migrants, Illyria, Phoenicia, even some Venetians and some Etruscans, and they just all got together. Um, and their main argument for this origin is the amount of loan words present within the Ration language. And this theory is actually true, like completely. Okay, well, not completely, like, like half, like, okay, like, like this much. And that's kind of the problem because the theory quickly falls apart when we realize that while there are some shared loan words, he seems to originate from literally all over the Mediterranean. And the crux of identifying the words in a language that we have neither fully mapped out nor that we can fully comprehend uh, makes the fact that ration itself is still up for debate. Because we have less of it decoded, 
Then we have Etruscan, and we are still kind of getting a handle on Etruscan itself um, in that while the grammatical rules of the language are understood, the meanings of the words, not so much. And so uh, many words that we might think um, are coming from a different uh, language, you know, we, we have without any context. And again, what that points towards is, yes, there are loan words, but the loan words don't make up the bulk of the language, not by a long shot. Um, and as such, modern Radic theater, uh, scholars don't think this theory holds that much weight. Mm. Additionally, though there are evidences of various different building styles, that theory, that part that theory A lacked, and we have some Phoenician style houses, some Illyrian style houses. These aren't full settlements. These are a house here and there, some ruins here and there, uh, not even clusters of houses. And we don't see these outside techniques applied in what would be traditionally described as radic building traditions. So that leads scholars to the following conclusion. Theory C. Durations are in majority the indigenous peoples of the Alps and the surrounding area. They were Paleo-European peoples speaking Paleo-European languages. And that's just a fancy way of saying they were there before we got the infamous Proto-Indo-European influences. Um, their original culture consisted of a hunter-gatherer society and was present since the last ice age. Now, I'm not saying that this is front to back identifiable as the Reti, but the Reti evolved from this continuing culture. Their first contact with the outside world came in the shape of the Paleo-Venetian and the, an early Proto-Indo-European splinter group of peoples who would later form what we now term the Venetians of antiquity. Uh, from there on, the Reishi would experience small waves of migration from disparate families and individuals from the Mediterranean, with the most dominant influence being likely a common ancestor of the Etruscans. Uh, with these, migrations failed to make a large-scale impact on the material culture, and they would affect the spoken and written language of the Reishi to a certain extent. Um, we know from uh, all over the world that changing a culture can take hundreds and hundreds of years, but changing languages can happen in as little as two generations. So what happened eventually is this ancestor, this common ancestor in this Tyrian language, um, blended with a lot of the immigration and the loan words, and then later on received further influence from Etruscan. Um, and while a few loan words hung around, most folks were simply absorbed into the Ration overculture, which could just be because it was the tried and true way um, of surviving in the mountains. That's how people did things. Then. Now, who are we talking about when we say the Rations? Um, so the Rations are the indigenous people of the Alps in northern Italy, including tribes labeled Ration and Communia. Uh, communion? Communion. I'm butchering that. I'm so sorry. Communion. Uh, partially the Ligurians, which are mentioned in a lot more ancient writings, but I say partially because we'll get into that history. And maybe the Leoponti, from whom we get the Leopontic alphabet, alphabet. Maybe. But that's a hotly contested topic, and we'll get into that in a little bit, too. So with that being said, let's talk about the specific tribal groups. So what the Reishi are, in fact, most known for are their petroglyphs. Uh, this form of rock art hung around for the Reishi, and it actually didn't cease with the ending of the Bronze Age. Um, we have some of these that are dated or suspected to be dated because dating with inscriptions on rock is very, very difficult, but they're suspected to have been done all the way up into a couple centuries before BCE. Um, and what we do see is a uniform technique, uh, themes and motifs, especially between the Ration and the Communion inscriptions, which is probably because they're the same people. Um, we also have some Ligurian stuff, which although varies slightly in the precise shapes, it depicts the same themes and motifs. And so it might point us towards a common ancestor. Um, so yeah, 
I will go as far as society with modern historians and group donations with the Kamuni. The, um, the Ligurians, as we see here in this uh, graph, they use an altered version of the Etruscan script that likens very, very much to the Venetian script, as do the Rations, and they actually have two. They have both an East and a West, and they're both very, very Venetian. Uh, the dating of most of these inscriptions is placed firmly within the Latin period and seems to be reactionary to this expansion. So that's kind of important, is that the bulk of Horatian inscriptions we get are actually as a direct result of the external uh, uh, pressure applied by cultures of the Latin period. Um, and while the Leopontic script is a bit more diverse, and I promise you we'll get to that, it's really the Communion alphabet called the Sandrino alphabet, which kind of stands out. So why is it that scholars say the Communi people are among the ranks of the Reiti? Well, it's simple and it's kind of a boring answer, but we don't actually know if the Sandrino alphabet is an alphabet at all, uh, even though it's called that. <laughs> um, we don't know if it reflects the language of the community, and it's simply not attested enough. There are four major stele inscriptions and using the Sandrino font, and they all vary, they're all different. They're not the same, they're just common enough that they have been grouped as a singular language. And of the four, one is clearly ration uh, linguistically, one, has produced results that are intelligible, whether you read it Celtic, Ration, or Etruscan. And one of them is clearly Celtic, whereas the last one is gibberish regardless of how you read it. Less than a handful of inscriptions can accurately be attributed to the community script, and the format doesn't seem consistent between locations, leading to the majority of scholars hesitant in labeling these inscriptions a uniform system at all let alone a language, but rather a methodology of scripting that arose in a border area where Etruscan, Ration, and Leopontic influences met. So if I pull up this graph right here, you will see um, everything's color-coded. Uh, we've got our Ration in green, our Venetian in blue, our Etruscan in pink. Um, we've got our Ligurian in red, and uh, we have our Communion in gray. And if you just notice that there are no Ligurian uh, inscriptions, good for you. Um, so as we can see right here, we have most of the inscriptions that use any sort of communion lettering are right there in that border region. Um, but I'd like to play Dispotter's advocate for a second and argue that the use of the Sabrina alphabet for maybe a dialect of uh, Ration or Celtic or Etruscan, it could really be used for all of these. Um, because what's quickly realized about this is that uh, there's a lot of shuffles of the fricatives, the stop closes, and even voiced and unvoiced compounds. They switch all around. And this is common for speakers of a non native language that you get the mouth shape wrong. And therefore, my suggestion is that these inscriptions simply represent the fact that the people living closer to the Celtic speaking Leoponti had more interactions with them and the Etruscan than the other Ration tribes. And so on rare occasions, a hybridized alphabet emerged for the sake of communication. Uh, this is a view that I found after developing it that I actually don't hold by myself. Um, this is also supported by uh, the people who work on the Thesaurus Inscriptorum Reticarum. Uh, unless I have misread their stance. And uh, that is the uh, largest online uh, database with critical examination of Horatian inscriptions. So uh, Strabo also labels the uh, community as living like Celts, but not being of Celtic stock. He further identifies them being, a, being of the same group of people as the Leoponti. And, and she terms both of those people Reti people. Now, Pliny, on the other hand, goes way into left field, and Pliny groups them as Illyrian people, but Pliny has been wrong already about his Etruscan origin, and if you've read his stuff, it's so-so. Um, so, now, 
there is some debate about the Ligurian Genesis. And as mentioned before, uh, the rise of Reti inscriptions is largely due to pressure exerted by the Lachian culture. Um, however, by the arrival of the Lachian culture, uh, the Ligurians were already on their way out. Um, they had primarily been displaced and their services as mercenaries uh, been taken over by various different members of the Hallstatt culture. Um, and we have a grand total of zero, that's right, zero inscriptions. So we have to rely on the words of ancient thinkers. And the problem is that that sort of perpetuates a, a vicious cycle of circular think thinking. They say, oh, well, they were Celts because they used Celtic words, or those words were Celtic because they were Celts who were using them, or oh, they were decidedly not Celts. Uh, they were using non-Celtic words and thus they were non-Celtic. And so mm, it's a kind of a mixed bag. There has, however, recently been DNA evidence um, that helps paint a bit of a clearer picture. So modern day peoples living in Liguria, who although they don't continue the same language, do continue uh, genetically, have an incredibly close relation to the only other European people that we know decidedly um, are Paleo-European, and that would be the Basque people. So there is a large degree of overlap between the Ligurian and the Basque people. Um, we know, however, that Ligurians also were very heavily Celticized and influenced based on their material culture and what people write about them. And so while DNA science is highly problematic, not clear cut, not cut and dry, at this point, it is best to consider the Ligurian people that they were at some point indigenous, um, but they had become heavily Celticized and that they created a sort of hybrid culture uh, over time. So here I have a proposed timeline. Uh, it's just a general overview. You can look at this while I uh, get through my next one because we're gonna talk about the Leoponti and where they fit in. And their place in all of this is sadly unknown. Again, we receive many different conflicting viewpoints from ancient writers. Strabo says clearly they're Reti, and they were undoubtedly Celtic and definitely Celtic speaking. And, you know, he might be right about that. They were Celtic speaking before they started to write things down. However, there are many shorter, smaller, and partial inscriptions um, that show that sometimes the Leoponti alphabet wasn't used to communicate Celtic at all. And so that's led an increasingly large amount of modern historians and archaeologists to ascribe a, a Raetic or native origin with the argument that they Celtified earlier and to a completer degree than anybody else. In contrast to the Ligurians who I just mentioned, who boasted probably a mixed culture, it seems that the Leoponti people adopted Celtic culture almost brick for brick. And as such, we can consider them Raeti an origin, but probably Celtic by the time the Lachian period rolled around as they were participants in it. So what does this all mean? What I'm suggesting is that what we're looking at here is sort of a bastion of sorts, uh, the last center of the indigenous uh, Paleo-European people who after the arrivals of other people began the process of cultural exchange. Over time, due to varying degrees of pressures for varying reasons, the first round of European inhabitants began taking on traits from the neighbors and the people who came in. Um, you know, like I said, the Kamui may have had slightly different uh, influences. Um, if their script does reflect their language, then they were more influenced by uh, Leopontic or Etruscan. They were all influenced by Etruscan, but varying degrees, because as we see, the Reti proper were supremely influenced by the Venetians. Um, they should safely render my idea. I hope that my last 10, 15 minutes of babbling have rendered the idea that the Kamuni, uh, Reti, and Ligurians being at some point or to some degree related is not an impossible one. So it's clear to me that retroactively we can apply the label Reti to all of these people to a certain degree, depending on the time period you're talking in, asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Now, let's get all the academic stuff out of the way and we'll get into the meat of the presentation. So we're going to talk about... Uh, Ration society. So, oh. 
So after the Bronze Age, or one should say towards the end of it, um, their material culture is analogous to any other culture that participated within the Hallstatt culture, a sort of large Central European overculture uh, based right around uh, what we think of now uh, a little bit uh, outside of uh, Slovenia. I could be a little bit off by that. I don't have a map in front of me. But um, as Hallstatt culture slowly uh, turned into Lachin, the Rations found themselves pushed more and more from their ancestral territory and were forced to withdraw into the Alpine mountains of Switzerland, Italy, Austria, and Tyrol, as well as their immediate surrounding areas and uh, where they would remain. And this is very likely when they first got the label Reti, um, which according to one etymology could mean mountain dweller uh, in Gaulish or Celtic. And while those in Tyrol retained their own language, those closer to Lachien, they followed the way of the Reti and uh, they followed the way of the Leoponti and adopted a Celtic tongue. So the society of the Reti, which is very interesting, because they don't reflect what we see from a lot of their neighboring cultures, that it was very matriarchal. And we know this from a lot of surviving lore and material finds, as well as testaments written about them from their helpful neighbors to the south, uh, the Romans. The line of secession and leadership was held within a maternal bloodline and passed from queen, now these are medieval historians, so let's not, queen is probably not an accurate title, but queen, for lack of a better word, a female or female presenting chieftain, um, while the highest ranking male would be a sort of co-king, but a leader in a war band and cattle raiding uh, capacity only. Uh, the role of magical spirit worker was often held by men, but precise religious knowledge and ceremony, like how rituals were to be run, was the domain of female or female presenting priests. So, uh, As we see here, uh, so men were allowed to practice with magic, same as women. Um, we have wandering healers of both uh, of the uh, primarily dominantly mentioned um, gender, um, but that is not to say that we have any sort of concept about gender performance in that time period, not by a long shot. Um, but as the Reiki Celtified, they gradually adopted a, a raiding party and a patriarchal lifestyle due to the deeply patriarchal neighbors and the influence they were receiving. Uh, the modification also resulted in their participation within the Hallstatt culture. And uh, the only surviving mythological cycle we have from them is uh, the Fane Saga, which is an epic cycle which deals exactly with the change from a matriarchal society to a patriarchal society. And we'll mention that briefly a little bit later, but um, it's clear that women continued to occupy important roles even uh, well after uh, Celtification and further on down the timeline. Um, Roman writers mention how, after being routed, uh, Ration women dashed in the heads of their infants against rocks and hurled them as corpses at the invading Romans. Well, that's definitely propaganda. Um, the kernel of truth in there is that the Reti women were forces to be reckoned with, and probably, just like their Gaulish neighbors, um, they were highly regarded and they rode into battle with their uh, men kinfolk. So yeah, we're going to talk about the material culture, as I touched on earlier. Um, they uh, were members of the Hallstatt culture. And while a lot of people think Hallstatt culture is a defined culture that directly precedes Gaul um, and co other continental cultures, this is a bit of a gross oversimplification, and it's not really how cultures in the past worked. And like all labels, it's retroactively applied. Instead, what we have to do when we talk about Hallstatt culture is think of it as the dominant way of life at the time that many people participated in. And the Reiki were one of those people due to external influences and then culture that they had absorbed. Um, as Hallstatt culture uh, people, their materials consisted of torques, solar wheels, some with a very, very unique and elaborate bend to them. Nevertheless, the bulk of the rations were metallically poor people, and the Bronze Age remained, and even the Bronze Axe remained 
up in use up until uh, the first century uh, CE. So, and many of the inscriptions we find, many of the votive offerings are in fact bronze and copper age axes, if that testifies at all to how scarce metal was for these people. Um, so the solar disk and Tyrannus wheel was incredibly uh, well represented as well. And uh, they would later on give way to the Merovingian uh, Zierscheibe or uh, the Germanic solar wheel, um, which is kind of a direct cultural inheritance. Um, we also have a very unique weapon that came out of this era. And oh, I thought I had like this. Uh, there was a very unique weapon, and it was called a Hellenbarden Axt, which is named after another Swiss weapon that came about a thousand years later, which is the halberd. But the Hellebarden Axt was a long battle axe. It's also known as the Alpine battle axe. You've heard it before. But the head of that actually, a battle axe. But the head of the battle axe wasn't attached directly straight like so for a chopping motion. Instead, it was attached like so, creating a curve that in theory, if you disregard my flawed human arm here, puts the center of gravity and weight directly in line with the haft, leading for a much more dexterous and maneuverable weapon. It had the same dexterity as a sword, despite requiring far less metal. Now, when metal became more available, it was supplanted by the sword. Um, but for a long period of time, this was the weapon of choice for many Reiti and many of the uh, Helveti and the uh, Nori from uh, Noricum who lived within the Alps. All right, so the religion of the Reiti. While the early religion of the Reiti, that is before the Bronze Age and before they were tyrannized, their ancestors um, may forever remain a mystery, we do have some really, really cool art from that time period. So we have got the stele or stela, um, and these tend to depict human beings, uh, or at least that's the current dominant theory. Um, They're oftentimes depicted with daggers and axes, which are tools not used for hunting or living, but instead for waging war. And it speaks a bit um, towards the change of that culture to a more war-oriented culture. And um, that's the uh, hypothesis of Alexander Richsteiner, and uh, who's the display curator at the Zurich Landesmuseum in Switzerland. If you ever have the opportunity, go. Um, if you don't have the opportunity, they have a virtual tour, completely free uh, with audio and everything. And it walks through, through a bunch of these stele, and not just from Central Europe, all the way down to Anatolia and Iberia. I highly recommend you check it out. Um, but his point was that the people in Central Europe had a flourishing ancestor cultus and that these depicted important people who were materially rich. These were also sometimes erected near grave sites. So there's also the theory that they could be grave markers or grave stones. Um, we also have, like I mentioned before, plenty, plenty of petroglyphs. Um, though, again, this is something that the Reiti took with them from thousands of years ago and carried all the way in um, to the Iron Age. They have gods, uh, animals, what we think are agricultural uh, prayer poses, ritual poses. Um, there's one down there that depicts a very similar event as in the, um, the man mating with a land ritual that we get from a lot of Irish lore and uh, over in Indian stuff. So we can attribute this to much later when a cultural influence from the uh, Indo-Europeans had already taken root. Um, the Alpine region of Reishe also seems to be a variable time capsule. Like I said, they hold on to a lot of these traditions a lot longer, when they, even when they had been discarded by peoples around them. And there is a language today in Reishe that is called reto romanche and essentially, it's a form of vulgar Latin because what we have is this original Latin that was then, uh, this original language, which is far gone, but which was covered up by the uh, incoming tyrannized language, then all the migration languages, then a strong Etruscan and Venetian influence, then it was Celtified, and then it was Latinized. And then people stopped 
telling them how to sound. And so they've just sort of stayed the same. There are approximately 36,000 people on the face of this planet. It's all that are left. There are approximately 36,000 people that still speak a form of vulgar Latin. That is to say, Latin mixed with the pre-Latin language of the area. Um, within folklore, there are generally two motifs that, uh, that exist. And uh, that is uh, one motif, which is a story comprised of common elements of the time. And one is the type of story that barely changes at all. And barely changes at all is graded on a curve because of course it changes. Um, but when it comes to the Ration lore, we have quite a bit of the latter type. We have stories whose core themes and motifs are true and consistent, but whose names, locations, and uh, minor details may alter over time because of the constant retelling. So this leads us to stories about Ration princes living in medieval towers facing off against Germanic invaders, or the Gallo-Roman Silvano being referred to as the Germanic dwarf, despite their appearance and the way they behave having nothing to do with the image of Germanic dwarves, but far more of the uh, Gallo-Roman Silvano. A few original racial gods, spirits, and heroes exist within the sagas and legends, but because these are now told in Reto Romanche, uh, the naming conventions have become folklorified and they are versions of themselves. If you're familiar with the Kalevala um, for the uh, Finnish mythologies, think more in the line of that. Um, nevertheless, we have some really cool stuff there. There's the evolution of the aspect of uh, Reitia, the Venetian goddess. Um, her triple aspect is there, her death aspect is there. Sometimes they're personified as the same person, sometimes different people. And while these would all be fascinating to unpack, um, we're going to get to the ones that we actually have attestations for. And this would be the gods of Verit. While we have several inscriptions from the Ration peoples that, although not always comprehensible, because again, we lack the context to know precisely what the words are, what we can do is recognize various names of gods among them. And the very first thing I want to lead with is the name of the Reitian gods, which is Isam, which is a loan word from Etruscan, who in turn borrowed it from somebody else. But we begin to see Etruscan stuff there already. And so what we can glean, and these are not, this is not a comprehensive list, but these are the gods that are most likely to be correctly identified within Ration inscriptions. Again, this doesn't take into account community ins uh, inscriptions, doesn't take into account inscriptions that were written by the Reti, but in a different alphabet, just Ration inscriptions. Um, we have the Etruscan Tinia called Tiano or Tianus. We have Venetian Reitia called Raitha. We have Thracian Castor. Um, and the only inscription we have from that is Kastri, which means belonging to or of the possession of Kastor. Um, we have Egyptian Isis, Etheth, and we have Gaulish Taranus, which is uh, turned into Tharani. There are a couple other possible theonyms that have been identified, and these would be uh, Laran, Ti, and Paith, but they are not anywhere close to being confirmed. These are more theoretical. Uh, what we do know is later on, we have various Gallo-Roman deities, such as Mars Multinus, Bellinus, Bacans, Borvo, um, Jupiter Apennine, Jupiter Poenius, whichever you want to call them, along with gods like Minerva and Juno and Hercules. So as we become Celtified, we get Celtic gods in there, like Poenius and uh, Carnonus and... Uh, Multinus, and as we become Latinized, we get Latin gods in there as well. Now, sometimes these take over the Celtic gods, sometimes they fuse with the Celtic gods, sometimes they're already synchronized and imported. Um, we also have uh, visual art depicting Carnonos and possibly the Dioscori, um, the divine horse twins, who are widely attested um, in terms of what we identify as typical material finds, twin horses, twin warriors, that stuff, but no inscriptions to confirm them. And what you may have noticed is that this hodgepodge of god names, many of them come from disparate and neighboring cultures and those they have exchanges with. And 
there's simply a couple explanations for this. Number one is Interpretatia Celtica and Interpretatio Romana, like we already talked about. These people are going to be accepting names from people that come in, so Interpretatio uh, Indigenica, but they're also going to be receiving names by people who have a lot more military or financial power, and sometimes for the sake of advancement, those are just accepted. Um, but as newcomers are uh, interacting with the Rations, they were very quick to identify them um, as what can best be described as euphoric. Uh, now, euphoric has a lot of different meanings, but within the context of the study of the history of Italic religions, euphoric gods are, we've labeled these uh, gods who are native, but their names become replaced with that of an outside god due to their ever-changing language and culture and some god names were replaced rapidly while others hung around way, way, way longer, which is why we find just shortly after Christianization, a ritual that is still being held in which we stumble across the divine pairing of Tianu, Tinya, with Raithe, Raitia. So we have Tinya and Raitia as a divine couple. In the end, while we may know only a few Ration names, we do know what a lot of the gods were called at some point, and this is oftentimes enough to start cult or to seed something and expand from there. Um, and so what's the difference between, you know, this euphoric, this syncretism or a cultural exchange? And a lot of it is a uh, semantics. Uh, I kid a little bit. Uh, the real difference is a marked different presentation or execution in the veneration of cults. So the same God that is two different cults. Um, for example, Venetian Raitia has three aspects that she's famous for. Um, uh, Ration Raitha also has three aspects, but one of them lacks the iconography that the Venetian does and instead has other iconography present. And we'll touch on that in a little bit but it shows a bit of a difference in the cult. Um, as such, I wanna talk about uh, Carnonos because he is another great example of this. Uh, the oldest known image of Carnonos is the one you see on the right. It's carved by communion hands. He is typically depicted seated cross-legged and uh, his arms out in a very distinctive shape, holding his torque. Um, what you're gonna notice though, is that in this inscription, he is standing. Um, now, this is no limitation of the medium. We have standing, falling, kneeling people within the cave art. Also note the pose of his arms. It's not in the uh, Oran's position. But then again, neither is Gaulish Carnonos. Though from here to here, there's a slight difference. It could just be artistic interpretation. Um, but we will find that this, the double biceps pose, is incredibly common um, amidst Ration uh, iconography. Now, here's the real thing. Carnonos doesn't seem to be holding his torque. If you kind of look near the elbow of the, I guess from our perspective, left hand, the torque is wrapped around the elbow. The snake is present, but it is not held in his hand. Instead, his arms are up and he is holding what appears to be a knife or a blade. A singular knife stretched out to the side, a pose quite familiar to us in oration, weapon, and ancestor worship. If you recall, those stele I showed you earlier had tons of weapon iconography. That is a theme that they carried with them. Now, you know, it's tempting to spiral into conspiracy theories about who premiered the idea and, and who did what and where he came from. But what's important, and the point I want to drive home, is the difference in cult that we see just from these two images. And uh, I hope it shines a bit of a clearer light on syncretism, euphoria, and different cults. And if that's not quite enough, I want to introduce you to some cultic practices. Um, as I said before, the worship and the utilization of ritual weapons within um, the Reti inscriptions is very, very uh, peculiar and very, very common. We find um, that with the emergence of the stele art, we see a lot of weapon depictions. 
Sometimes the head of the assumed ancestor figure resembles a blonde bronze leaf dagger. Other times the stele itself depicts numerous weapons. We also note from various engravings that a second prayer position exists. Um, in addition to, you know, the double biceps, uh, we've also got one of these bad boys where they're holding their heads, their hands on top of their head with a weapon pointing upwards. Um, the precise nature of this uh, exact pose is unknown, but that lovely gentleman you see there in the top right, he actually heads uh, the museum and a reconstruction group um, based in the Valley of Wonders, which is where the majority of Ligurian inscriptions are from. And uh, his theory is that this is a magic working pose, whereas this is a requesting help or aid pose. Um, and the idea of weapons being required or a part of worship um, is not limited to just these. We have in folklore, especially the Thane saga, which I mentioned earlier, uh, the concept of someone asking for divine aid comes up time and time again. And in several of these, there is a bronze axe, which, as we said, was still a staple of their culture at the time, that has to be relinquished in order to receive divine aid. Now, if they ever get the, uh, the bronze axe back, we don't know. Um, but if every single uh, prayer or ritual had to accompany, uh, uh, you know, a, a surrendered bronze axe, um, that we either have tons of axes we haven't find, uh, found yet, or they didn't pray a lot. Uh, but this motif even actually makes it into Christianization. Um, we have uh, the story of the Reverend Saint Wolfgang, who uh, is on a pilgrimage, you know, through the uh, the Ration Alps, and he is accosted by Satan's demons. They pop out of every crevice, and you know all that Christian, wonderful, colorful storytelling, um, where they have the horns and the claws, and they hound him, they harass him for weeks and weeks on end. And one day, when he's running, he stares straight ahead, and he sees a mountain, and the mountain in front of him splits open. And St. Wolfgang runs into the mountain, it closes behind him, and it keeps him safe from the demons. And, you know, he says, wow, this is it. This is the place. You know, the, this mountain helps me. Of course, he attributes this to God's intervention, but the mountain helps me. And so the mountain opens up, he comes out again, and he swears that as reciprocity for this divine aid, he will take his copper axe, which for some reason this Christian saint has, he will take his copper axe and he will throw it into the valley. And wherever it lands, he will build a church. And that's exactly what it did. He threw it. And according to the legend, it flung for three kilometers until it hit the ground. And there is where we have today the church of St. Wolfgang um, in the town of Salzkammergut, which is where we actually have the largest deposition of Hallstatt era material finds because of that is where the famous Hallstatt era salt mine occurs. So this Christian saint essentially performed a ritualistic deposition of his weapon when asking for advice on where to build a settlement. Um, and as thanks for helping him from the mountain. Um, yeah, and that's exactly that gentleman up at the top. His name is Sivarua. And uh, he also champions the idea of the relinquishing of the weapon as a material act. Um, and so uh, we also see that there is a, a bit of something that uh, we could take from them here. And so I um, have already begun incorporating some of these elements into my personal practices because the Alps is where I base my reconstruction off of. And so I would like to introduce to you kind of an idea of how this could be applied and what its application might be to modern polytheists. What I hear oftentimes is that people are talking about um, travel authors. You know, we, we're going out of town. Um, I have nothing to pray. Um, you know, oh, my mother's coming over. I gotta hide everything if you're not out of the broom closet yet. And so what I wanna talk about is how we can use a simple pocket knife in order to create our very own travel altar. And what I'm doing is combining the three different uh, poses that we have. Now, I'm not saying this is historic, but I think the spirit of this will be right in line with something the ancient Croatian people did. And so, very first thing you can do, you have your pocket knife, words up, and place it on your head, 
begin the incantation, you know, whoever you're asking, Karnonas, great diviner, horned god of the wild, liminal master, whatever you want to say, you know, there's a, there's a request. And then if there is a sympathetic magic portion or any sort of workings you want to do, you transition and strike into this pose. And then if there's a request or an asking, or you just want to make an offering or libations, you could take this and either drive it into the ground or simply place it if you're indoors. And you can proceed with your ritual. Then you can reclaim it, cycle through the positions again. The action is done. I have performed it. Place it back on your head and close. Simplest travel altar in the world. Um, now, the weapon cult isn't the only unique cultic practice to the nations. Uh, we also have Schallensteine, or what they're called uh, shell stones. Um, these are carved out of uh, several indented bowls and rocks across the Alps and Central Europe. And this is also a practice that originated far before the Bronze Age and was carried far, far, far uh, into even the Iron Age. And uh, this too has a modern application. Um, they are oftentimes depicted um, carving of hand or footprints, so we knew the exact position the worshiper was expected to take when performing a rite, which is how we know that these were actually cultic sites. Now, the image in the bottom right is actually not from the Alps. That one comes from Ireland. But as you can see, the concept of hollowing out bowls in rocks, perhaps for cultic purposes, was not unique to the Raiti. It's actually found in Scandinavia. Um, in the Mediterranean and in one particular location in France, um, as well as all of the Isle, all of the, the British Kingdom and Ireland. Um, and there's still a lot of folklore associated with these places. Uh, people tell of, uh, you know, strange witches that live underneath the stones or ghosts that'll come out of them in the middle of the night. And, uh, you know, you're especially warned, don't take a nap on that stone. You take a nap on that stone, you're going to sit right through it, and the witch who lives inside is going to eat you. You're also told not to leave your lunch on the stones, because if you do, it might not be there when you turn around again. Um, and while the stories don't point us towards, you know, a specific use, they do communicate that, to this day, the common consensus is that these as liminal spaces, something very old and primitive and pagan. Um, now, we also have uh, smaller stones, which have been found as material goods. And this is what I want to touch on as well, um, which might have a modern application. Traditionally, these bad boys are made out of sandstone. So what you can do, really easy, get yourself a small piece of sandstone. And hollow this out. Perfect. You can carry it around with you. Put your libations in there if you want to. If you're not a pocket knife kind of person, easy peasy. And these may even be historical. Now, we have found them in various shapes and sizes, and you know, they could be used for a variety of things. They could be as simple things as, you know, nutting stones, similar to the First Nations peoples here in America. Um, but I like the theory that they're travel altars. It's just neat. Um, there are also... Uh, several uh, folk costumes that support the idea that these were once used as offering spaces. Um, uh, there are folk practices throughout Austria, Tyrol, Switzerland, in which it's customary to put pine needles, boiled eggs, or animal fat into these bowls, um, you know, as good luck charm in order to find true love, in order to figure out if your husband is cheating on you, basically a request, but without the invocation of a religious figure. Now, what's really curious about those three offerings I mentioned, um, animal fat, boiled eggs, and pine needles, is that they're eerily similar to the Roman uh, genus Loki concept, especially the version that we find prominent in Pompeii. Um, the snakes are personifications of domestic and spirits of the land, and Within uh, Ration folk tales, we have the snake with the crown upon its head, which is a motif that arrives as early as the uh, eighth century. Um, as you see here, we have a commemorative Swiss coin that depicts a cute little snake with a crown. 
Um, over on the top left, we have uh, from a medieval bestiary that depicts a crowned snake. And these snakes, again, were said to live in and around and under uh, these shell stones. And there is a famous Christian um, account of a, a, a magical worker gifted by God who went into the land and called forth all of the crowned snakes and lured them into a fire. And since that day, you know, there's been no more ghosts in these parts. But uh, again, that points towards there being a cultic holdover. Now, this snake with the crown, to me, invokes some uh, similarities with uh, Karnonos's uh, horned serpent, but that's nothing more than conjecture on my part. Uh, but it's interesting to see how a cult practice like this I'm feeling that I stuttered a little bit, so I'm going to slow down. But it's interesting to see how a cult practice like this was carried on and is even practiced in some places to the modern day. So uh, we also have uh, the sun cult. And uh, this is something I've termed uh, the cult of the sun and the earth water because uh, earth and water are very much connected. And uh, we'll get into that in a little bit. But uh, we, like I said, we have here... As mentioned before, several distinct sun disks from Celtic styles to examples that seem to be precursors to the Merovingian Seerscheibe and are interpreted here as solar symbols. And uh, a unique version of that is found chiefly among the Camui, and the archaeologists have actually dubbed this uh, the Communion Rose. So if you see here um, on the PowerPoint, there is an image of a four-spoked wheel, and I am now holding up a variation of this theme, which appears later on in Merovingia. And around my neck, you also see a variation of this theme. It is a five-pronged solar wheel. Um, and I want to quickly preface that none of these solar wheels are in any way related to the Black Sun. That is an image that came about much later at much more nefarious hands. Um, and these just have the unfortunate coincidence of being a wheel with spokes. Uh, however, these, as I've uh, hopefully illustrated, go back all the way to the Bronze Age. Uh, the Communion Rose is, a, as I said, the signature. Um, from the Fain Sagas, which is the folklore that I was talking about earlier, um, we do know a few really cool things that pertain to the Cult of the Sun. So we know the optimal time said to create both magical effects as well as perform ritual is in the morning. In Albalinia, a sickly princess is ordered to perform a magic ritual in the mornings in order to increase her strength and vitality. In the titular Fane saga, uh, the hero, Aiden Nuit, uh, must summit a mountain before dawn in order to perform cult upon it so that victory in battle is assured. Uh, in the hour of midday when the, is when the sun is most visible, and among the Rations, as we see later in the folklore, the hour of midday held special significance. Uh, in the wedding of Merisana, it is hailed as the one hour of universal peace all across the land, which must be adhered to. Otherwise, Merisana, who is a folklorification of Raitha, Raitya, um, will not give her, son, give her hand in marriage to the sun god, Rei de Reis, the king of the Reis, who might be either Tianu or uh, Thrani. Um, that's up for interpretations. Um, but she will not give her hand in marriage unless he can secure her one hour of peace during the midday, the most holy time. Um, there is also the story of Sorengina, a demigoddess and personification of sunbeams. She is invincible during the day. She cannot be harmed. And during the hour of midday, she is stronger than Aiden Wait, who is a uh, renowned hero. She beats him by a long shot during that hour. And uh, however, if she stays up past midnight, she will die. So this does communicate, uh, communicate uh, a sense of the ration concept of the day beginning at dawn and the night um, ending somewhere, uh, or the day ending somewhere around midnight at the latest. Uh, we also see the sun described as being the Lord and God of the people, as well as our Lord, gracious God, in the Orona and the saga, The Children of the Sun, two legends from the Dolomite sagas. Um, 
the thing is, these stories are heavily, heavily uh, Christian influenced. But what we see here is a desire for Christian authors to explain the sun cult of their pagan ancestors um, by saying that the Arations indeed saw the face of God within the sun, where they saw the sun and exclaimed, this must be Lord God. Um, we know the Ration solar god was addressed by several names. Uh, the most common inscription we find is Tianu, and we also find a very common inscription being Tharani. Um, both of these, due to their wheel associations, might be the solar god. Both of these might also be titles for the same solar god based in a euphoric context, with the earlier being uh, Tianu and the later being Tharani, but the science is still undeclared. And while I promised I wouldn't get into specific gods, I would be remiss not to talk about the cult surrounding Raithya, as she seems to be the most active and revered of the sun and water cult. Uh, early Venetian inscriptions point us toward Parca Raithya, which is pointed out etymologically uh, by Ulrike, means that Parca, who is like Raithya. So we can already sense that Raithya was not the original name of this goddess, uh, though it does fade away and is the majority of inscriptions are dedicated to Raitya or Raitya Healer, uh, which is a name that was undoubtedly taken up due to contact with the Venetians. Um, and her cult was a little bit different among the Raiti. Uh, see, the Raiti Raitya differs a bit from her Venetian cognate. Despite being still a trifunctional goddess who works as a group of matrona, uh, a liminal goddess who has strong associations with waters and key, her horse iconography, which is very, very present within Venetian Raitya, fades. Instead of having a horse and a mare of the land imagery similar to Gaulish Epona, she seems to take on a more magna mater role as Earth Mother, which Sevier Seif and uh, Dumazil both equate to the role of the uh, horse mother in a non-Indo-European context. So we see Venetian Raithya with her more Indo-European influence has a horse aspect as a horse mother, whereas the more uh, or further removed from Indo-European aspect of the Raitian Raithya uh, has an earth mother aspect instead. Um, despite the horse being a keen player in Alpine life, it was a relatively late addition. And if the goddess, who would later be called Raithe, predated the arrival of the horse, it might explain why there was no horse imagery attached to her cult, probably because the goddess was worshipped before the introduction of and widespread use of the horse in the Alps. She does, however, keep her signature blue dress and head covering within both cultures, an aspect she would later share with her spiritual successor in the area, Mother Mary. Raishia's triple aspect would later undergo official sainthood as the Salige Frauen in the German-speaking parts of Grison and Tyrol, as well as the Heilige Betten in the Bayerisch territory. And I actually misspoke, that's unofficial sanctification. The people regard them as saints, but the Catholic Church does not acknowledge them as such. Uh, said to dwell within streams, within mountains, and where they watch over humanity, and they can see all fate. As well as near giant trees or under the earth, they also held the roles of protectors of the wilderness and stewards of animals, which does correspond to Venetian Reich. Within two shapes, we see her most in the kingdom of the faints. We do have scant evidence of a folk ritual, recorded secondhand by Hugo di Rossi, an Austrian folklorist, and published in 1912 after nearly four decades of research. I will now read an excerpt by Ariano Vatti, who gives his thought and commentary on Rossi's statement while also making references to uh, statements made on uh, Rossi's words by the great Ulrike Kindl. Um, so, here we go. The low and somewhat aside of the Silassier, on the Col de Mer we located, where every year a great festival was held in May. In the middle there was a stone altar, around which the façons danced in circle adorned with flowers. The festival was holed under a large pitch tree during the Regola, a general assembly of the people which lasted eight days together with the allies, 
Every day at sunrise, men assembled to deliberate about justice and common defense. The military leaders of each valley were nominated and dots and stars were painted on the warrior's shield. After midday, they bellowed a horn and at this signal, the people would be allowed to climb up. Everyone hurried to be able to see the sacrifice. Two or three veals were killed, and they danced and sang and prayed. Competitions and games were held. A straw puppet was burnt. This tradition went on after the Christianization also, but with the puppet only and with no altar. Now a procession is held in St. Vito's honor, but in carnival, the straw puppet is still burnt. And now I will uh, recite to you the prayer. From the nearby Col de Sas de la Ve, a priest intoned an ancient song. Nos dobnem bibevu, a nom de numa isas, a nos iton e pablo asa, pos mort i elis adu, ant tiniares abu, pepetor picol coa, umbarat les bot tash em slapgara. What's interesting about that, and it's weird, it's very weird, is the language seems to be of two distinct sections. The first being made up mostly of corrupt Latin, so the Latin that uh, the peasants spoke, while the second is largely proto ladinian That's the Celto-Ration or just Ration language pre-Latinization. What we have is Tiniares might point us towards an invocation of Tianu and Reith, which by that point with the sound change would have become Reis. And we have here an example of the sun and earth water cult. I'll now give you the translation. We must drink wine in the name of the gods, the stone jug. To health and food and enough. After death, the Elysium to all. In front of Tianu and Reis, we offer a sacrifice of young animals. In exchange, we receive children, food and drink available for us. You Kindle remarks that this legend is really taken from the recount of the Roman analyst Annus Florus, who didn't refer to it as being placed in the Fossa Valley, but the peoples of Noricum in general. And therefore she says, uh, this is less a uh, original ceremony and more a learned deviation on a popular theme. Either way, I think it's marvelous that we have a large chunk of this ritual uh, preserved. Or in the case of uh, all early folklore uh, studies, it could simply be made up. But given that a lot of the words in the Proto-Lardinian were found later on to be very similar to Ration inscriptions, which at that point were not translated, I do have a little bit of hope. Now, the primary way of offering to the gods was either in a stream or river or by lighting a large bonfire at the foot of the mountain. And this also occurs within the Fane saga. We have prayers and magic being performed at dawn, but large fires being lit at the base of the mountain at dusk. Um, these Brandopferplätze are notorious because of the sheer volumes of offerings we find. It seems the methodology was much the same with other cultures at the time. The object was destroyed, bent, crushed, cut, and then tossed into the flames. This is why we have several small and broken pieces of votive offering. A lot of the sagas also contain the motif of circling the fire three times, but whether this was already present within Ration thought or is a later addition is hard to say. Uh, the Rations also had a strong connection to various animals. Um, and as we can see here, a lot of these bronzes, and while we do have a lot of antlers and other leftovers, the antlers actually outdate the bronzes. The bronzes are what stays intact uh, in the cases where they were not cut or crushed. And what strikes me the most with a lot of these is you can see, especially the image of the horse and the fish and the man in the top right, is that these have a pinhole through them, which is also what a lot of the antler has. So I quite like the idea, especially since they are flat on one side, that these were worn around as uh, talismans and votive jewelry. Um, and when it came time for uh, an offering, they would be removed from the neck or the belt of the individual and tossed into the flame. Um, 
I think this carrying around of the talisman with you would uh, create a stronger bond between the object and its owner and therefore render the sacrifice of greater value. Uh, again, this is not attested, but I do quite like the idea. And uh, another example of the Ratians having strong connections with uh, animals is that uh, you, they assigned a lot of strong spiritual meaning to different animals. And they're oftentimes depicted as avatars of gods or even gods themselves. And a couple examples that appear in folklore are the fox, the hound, the marmot, the eagle, uh, the horse, and oftentimes entire lineages of people, entire houses would engage in pacts with certain animals. Uh, often mundane or animal members of these species were simply regarded as ancestors or the other side of the family. Meaning if you came across a, a fox in the wild and uh, your family had this intimate relationships with foxes, then that would be the same as meeting a distant cousin. Um, but because both legends and folklore state uh, that there are many things which should not be spoken of, the details of how an exchange or of uh, culture and a bond between man and animal would be formed, um, as well as the folklore forbids the speaking of several helping spirits, um, I sadly can say no more. Um, I would definitely encourage you to research it if the topic does interest you, but uh, as a bit of a galloration myself, I can speak no more on this. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. And after all this, I ask the question, what can we take from the Ration? Due to their colonization, I find a lot of their culture was very compatible with Gulls. I think the ability to form intimate relationships uh, and close spiritual bonds with uh, places as well as animals, as well as the travel altars, um, I hope can add a lot of benefit to uh, any polytheist watching this presentation, but especially our Gaulish polytheists. So uh, with that, I'll take any questions. We're gonna rapid fire uh, at least one question if anyone had, had any more. Uh, so you're saying that the Radi were a direct continuation of the Meso Mesolithic Europeans. What about the early European farmers who we know colonized the Alps in the Neolithic? Yeah, and I think a lot of that is because I am not formally educated and the way I burst it uh, might have come off that way. What I'm saying is that these were their ancestors and um, they had not received like significant admixture that changed their society until Proto-Indo-European influx. Um, I could be wrong about that. As I said, I'm not a historian yet. So um, it, I will have to look a lot more into the migration of the farmers, which I didn't know about. But no, I don't want to make the impression that this is an uninterrupted mega culture or whatever. I simply want to illuminate the fact that a lot of traditions that were started by uh, the ancestors of these people were carried through even as religious modalities changed. So the dolmens were kept, the cairns were kept, the fires were kept, um, the shell stones were kept, uh, the knife in divine function was kept. And these are things that I think are valuable because they lasted several religious frameworks and even into folklorification. And these, I think, are probably the big meat that we can take from a lot of this. But that's a great question. I'm sorry if I came across that way. It's all, it's all good. That, that question was from Sega um, uh, Yeah, so thank you so much for oh. now. Um, I, 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 yeah, I see one more question. Um, yes, yeah, yeah. The axe lobbing um, with St. Wolfgang and Clovis. Um, that's really, really cool. Um, I actually, because I was so hung up on the mythology of the Rations, you know, it's not every day you stumble over basically the Kalevala for uh, people who have scarcely been mentioned that I was so focused on a lot of the folk tales in there. And in there, it's a, it's a quite common theme. And so when I found the, uh, the legend, um, I sort of put one and one together, but I didn't even think about looking further out there. And I didn't even think about the story about Clovis. And I would really, really love to dig into that more, especially if that's a common motif in that surrounding area.